I will try to uh, speak without the mic as well, but if I get too uh, silent, just give me a sign. So I actually um, continue from what Alberta said. I actually did this uh, Gmail thing where you try to think about the time when you are dead, and you have to you have to write like a message to somebody. So I wrote a message. It was a very strange experience. My girlfriend, and baby, I'm probably dead, or I'm making it look like I'm dead or I'm away. In any case. Don't bother with my email, I didn't never read it anyway. But for Christ's sake, take care of my Twitter account. So, true story, that's what I... And it's a strange experience to, to write this letter pretending or thinking about a time when you're not, more, not there anymore. On off, on off. On off, okay, thanks. And uh, this one. I'm sorry. Okay, this one, yeah. So I'm Jan, I work at Idealo, it's a, um, uh, a price comparison team. The team is called uh, Conceptual and UI Design. We didn't call it, or I didn't call it UX team, because I'm really the opinion that it's not one team that contributes to user experience, it's the entire company. We are 15 uh, people at our on the team, and if you are curious, how we work, we can talk about it in the break. Idealo is a price comparison platform. You want to buy something, you go there, you find the cheapest price, you click on it, and you away again. We have 230 million offers, and it's a great place to work because e-commerce is very, it's a crazy space to work, and we're always looking for interesting people. So thanks a lot to the team of the World IA Day. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks, it was a pleasure to be here. And I will be talking about something that's called Jobs to be Done. It's not new, not new at all. But I sort of discovered it for myself like three years ago and tried to tell you a little bit about it. I studied um, microbiology and genetics in Frankfurt and after getting having studied everything, or not everything, but the topics I had to, I went to, to Berlin in the year of 2000 and began working in web design, and that's where I stuck until this day, actually. And <coughs> from web design, it became app design, software design, digital product design, whatever you want to call it. I've been there since, yeah, for the last 15 years. I then studied uh, library information science next to my job, and sometimes people ask me, yeah, you did this somewhat perhaps stupid thing. You did biology and then library information science and web design. Does this somehow, how did, do, does this match at all? And for me, it, I was always super interested in, in working and using information to, to build stuff. To, for, to me, always information was like, like a clay where you can build stuff out of it using building blocks out of information. And there's lots of stuff you can read and, and people say about information. And when I say information, by the way, I don't mean data. If you are interested in the difference between data and information, look it up, it's an interesting read. But I really, I'm talking about information. And so they say a lot of stuff about information. It's the currency of the 21st century, it's the currency of democracy, the currency of business, information is power, everything. And let's somehow, cool and, and, and interesting stuff to say, but for me always it boils down to what the Information Architecture Institute write and what, in, what to me the business, the job of an of a information architect actually is all about, and that is making the complex clear. And that's something I really try to remember in my day job when I work on apps, on digital projects, web design, software, software design, whatever you want to call it. Another way to make this uh, statement is what I really like is uh, citing Saul, Richard Saul Woman. He said once, we have to remember, especially when we, when we work on those complex projects, we have to remember what it's like not to understand. We have to understand what it's like not to understand. And this is a very important uh, sentence for me. And I try to keep it in the back of my mind. And when I say product, um, 
I also mean service, and when I say service, I mean product. There is a difference between this, but I'm not going to talk about this here. I think we could simply, for, for, for to make things sim easier, just say we, it's all products, some are more service-like, whatever. And I will be talking about design in a minute, and when I talk about design, I'm not talking about art. Art, for me, is different. Art is, art probably needs no justification. Art probably even doesn't need a beholder. I'm not talking about art. I'm always talking about design in the context of products, actually. Products need a user, a consumer. They need an environment. So there was, in the year of 2000 and later, trying to make beautiful stuff. And by beautiful stuff, I mean simple, usable product. And it turns out, actually, it's not super hard to make beautiful stuff. You simply have to follow some rules. Let's call them style, but it's not exactly style. You could say gestalt principles. Well, you can follow some rules, and you can actually come up with pretty decent stuff. For example, I don't know if you are into app design, but if you are developing or if you are looking into uh, developing for the Android platform, you might know the material design language. On the iOS, they have the HIC, the Human Interface Guidelines. You can follow those guidelines and come up with very decent looking software. And you have this beautiful thing, and it's like, you know, you can cook by the rules and you can follow a process and end up with a very beautiful, nice meal, but still have no one show up for dinner. So this, at one point, I started thinking, this is strange. We make these beautiful objects, but our users are not happy with them. Well, actually, perhaps there are no users at all. So this is a study from Accenture from the year 2000. And they show the reasons cited for failure of new products. You can now probably read it. The top reason for failure of new product is the product did not meet customer needs. That's strange. <laughs> you build new products and most of them don't meet customer needs. This is Marty Kagan, a very smart man from the, uh, I think, from the Silicon Valley business angel community. And he comes up with a rule, or with rules for product discovery. And they're not just some kind of rules, those are fundamental rules. And he's a clever guy. So what are those fundamental rules of product discovery? Rule number one, at least two thirds of our ideas are never gonna work. Why? Because customers just don't care. And the other third will take some iteration before it does what it needs to. So two thirds of the products you're gonna build never gonna work and the other third, well, won't work either until you put some more effort in it. So that's sad, isn't it? Imagine would be, you would be students, I think you are students, but you would study, I don't know, you would be like trying to become <coughs> doctors, physicians, and I would tell you, hey, it's, a, it's an okay idea to become a doctor, but you have to realize most of the time you won't be able to help your patients anyway. That's it. If only there would be a way to make it better. This is Peter Drucker. He uh, used to be, I think, a, like a management consultant. Many, many years ago, he came up with this brilliant observation. The customer rarely buys what the business thinks it sells him. One reason for this is, of course, says Peter Drucker, that nobody pays for a product. What is paid for is satisfaction. So let's pause for a second and agree on what a product actually is, because that's important. A product is, and I merged some summaries I find, and I agree with this actually, an item that satisfies customers' needs is manufactured for sale. So a product is an item or a good that satisfies customer needs is manufactured for sale, and sale means the exchange of any values. 
So there we have the satisfi satisfaction thing again. Let's revisit Peter Drucker. The customer rarely buys what the business thinks it sells him. One reason for this is, of course, that nobody pays for a product. What is paid for is satisfaction. <coughs> this is Clayton Christians, one of the uh, main thinkers behind the jobs to be done thing. Some call it a framework, but nowadays everything is a framework. Uh, Clayton Christensen wrote, the consumer has a different view of the marketplace. He simply has a job to be done and is seeking to hire the best product or service to do it. So somehow, perhaps when we are building products, we, we, we got this idea of what the product is wrong. And it looks like a way out of this is to zoom in on the user, on the customer. If we just somehow could deep dive and zoom in on this guy or girl. Well, it turns out there's a thing that's called design, and this is Tim Brown, one of the design, leading design thinkers out there, that does exactly that. Design, Tim Brown says, is human-centered. Design starts with what humans need. And speaking of human-centered design, there's actually a super official standard, uh, many years old, by the, released by the ISO, International Organization for Standardization. So that's an official standard, and in there you find, in, this, in the document with this very, very long name, you find actually the official documentation of the user-centered design process. So you have to go to your library because you have to buy, buy this otherwise and it's not cheap. And look it up. And there you find the documentation of the human-centered design process. And while you're looking at this document, actually, there's something, there's another thing that's super interesting. And this is this one. In this document, there's an official definition of user experience. When you start working in information architecture, interaction design, design, user experience, you will all the time hear people saying, well, actually, we don't know what user experience is. Well, we should know. It's written in the standard. And it's this. A person's perceptions or responses that result from the use or anticipated use of a product. So it's basically what, um, what um, Alberta was saying, and also it matches with what, was, what um, Andrea was saying. It's a reaction to an interaction, and this can also be a memory, or it's in reaction to an anticipated use of a product. So back to our um, beautiful design of useless things. What we can do is to focus on the user. And then we take basically the need, we take it, feed it into our process, whatever that process is, but we take it, feed it into the process, and then we hopefully, or realistically actually from my experience, come up with a product that the user actually needs. So the next sort of um, important thing is to agree on what a need is. And to me, the, the word need, and I'm not a super, my English language is not super good. I'm actually uh, from, the, from the Czech Republic, so it's a strange word, a need. What is a need? Who knows? But there's a pretty good um, definition of a need, and I really try to use it, and, and I like it a lot. And it's this one. A need is the desired outcome. A need is the desired outcome. And when I say need, I'm not talking about features, like this one, it's, we're not talking features, we are talking about the successful completion of a job. That's what a desired outcome is, the successful completion of a job. So that's where we enter the jobs to be done world. A job to be done is a problem a person is trying to solve within a particular circumstance. A job to be done is a problem a person is trying to solve in a particular circumstance. If you are in the UX business and you read something about 
blah blah blah, a person blah blah blah, you immediately begin to think in personas. I don't know if you already had personas or used personas. Personas are this uh, this, this this fake user, and most of the time, personas are also based on fake data, so <laughs> fake all over the place. And they are not a research tool, they are a communications tool, but people use them for research. It's crazy. And in the, in the UX business, they are something like the holy grail. You should never actually enter a um, UX conference and try to make fun out of personas, because that's really uncool. This is one persona, for example. Let's call him Francis. He's single, male, adult. He's an adult. Goes to church. He has a website, but he's not this admin guy. So you can come up with a fake story about what Francis does his entire day. And then you suddenly say, and that's why he needs this uh, chat box in the footer. Why? That's totally, it's a fake story. And when you actually look behind the real people who could be Francis, it could be like a bachelor or the Pope, who knows? <laughs> What's the point in making those fake, in coming up with those fake people? So in uh, the jobs to be done way of thinking, we say, to hell with personas, who cares? And that's why I like because it's uh, mixing things up in this somehow, sometimes more or less boring UX world. We try to focus on context. The context is the important part. The situation you are in. We heard a lot about toilets today. <laughs> You're sitting on the toilet doing your stuff. <laughs> what do you need? You need certain things. Who cares if you are a power user with a state-of-the-art smartphone or you are a single mom, whatever? The situation, that's the thing that really counts. So context. A job to be done is a problem a person is trying to solve within a particular circumstance. So let's have a look at those problem things. When I say problem, I'm not, mean, I'm not talking about like a huge world-changing thing like world peace. Who knows this movie? Okay, put it on your to-do list, watch Groundhog Day tomorrow, super important for your future. You don't have to, we're not talking about world peace, we're thinking about, when we, say, when we talk about problem solving, about those little things, those little things we have to do to get things done. Why? Because we humans are very progress oriented, you know, I want to put stuff on my wall or make a beautiful home, I want to have my home clean, I want to have my uh, teeth clean, whatever. I have those little, little, little and many steps and I want to get them done because I care <laughs> for progress. And those are the jobs we are talking about. This is Theodore Levitt, a um, former business consultant. He said also many years ago this interesting thing. People don't, why, people don't want to buy a quarter inch drill. They want a quarter inch hole. Mm. When I want to put something on my wall, let's say, like a huge image of my mother-in-law, <laughs> why not? <laughs> in the bedroom, of course. I'm not interested in buying a drill. I need this crazy hole, a wall, a hole in the wall to hang this huge image onto my wall. And actually, if you would stop, if, if you are, let's say you are in the business selling those drills, so you will always try to sell me another drill, another drill, in the next feature, whatever, the better drill. But if you would stop thinking in drills, in solutions, and would actually try to understand my problem, you would realize I perhaps don't even want to have this crazy hole in my wall. Just send me something which allows me to put the image on my wall. So a job is the fundamental goal customers are trying to accomplish. And the nice thing about goals and, and, and jobs 
in the way I'm talking about them, is they are pretty stable. And our solutions, they rotate around them. For example, you are, let's say, you're not in the drill business anymore, you are now in the carriage business. So you build those beautiful carriages and you can probably build them forever. Or you are in the train business and you build trains or you build planes. If you don't realize that you're actually not in the train business, the plane business, the carriage business, but you're actually in the travel business, you will forever stop and stuck to your sealer. You always keep on thinking in this one solution. Why is there no, uh, and this is a very rough example, I agree, why is there no carriage manufacturer who builds planes or trains? Because we always tend to uh, keep thinking in one solution. So jobs can be functional, emotional, or social. There are different kinds of jobs. And there's one thing we really have to look into when talking about jobs to be done, and that's causality. Why causality? You might remember I said information. It's all about information, not data. Well, we try to understand causality, not data. Why? Because when we are in product development, we are, let's say, product design, service design, we actually try to predict the future. Why? Because you are building, you invest all your energy, your love, your time into building this product, and you're making a bet whether people or consumers would buy it or not. So you have to try to understand the future to make a better prediction about, the about uh, whether your product will be successful or not. That's why it's super important for us product designers or service designers to make a more or less educated guess about the future. And the thing with data is, data can tell you a lot about your past. We use data all the time, we use like log files, whatever, mouse flow, everything, all those files. But they always tell us um, <coughs> what, what happened yesterday. So it's like looking into a back mirror. There's no data about the future. And that's why we really have to understand uh, causality. So how do we understand causality? Well, in HCD, human centered design, there's an old and trusted and really proven, proven, proven way of doing th things. We have to observe users. That's super important. Observing users, you will do it basically all your life if you want to join the UX party, so to say. Why do we have to observe users? Because users actually tend to lie to us if you ask them. Let's say I have this invisible gadget, and I ask the user, would you buy this invisible gadget for, let's say, three ninety nine? dollars It's really cool, and it will make you even more attractive. And the user will say, I think I would buy it, yeah? Why not? I believe you. Users will tell you everything if you ask them. That's why you really don't, you can't trust them. Of course, a little bit harsh to say we are all liars, but... It's for us as humans, it's almost impossible to really judge our own behavior. So that's why you have to observe them. Why? Because we, we need to understand, going back to those needs, we need to understand what users really need, what problems they have, they want to have fixed. This is Reef, they make sandals. They sell those sandals, they're super successful. And you know how it is, you're surfing, riding the waves, almost naked, and then you enter the beach and you drink your beer. There's no bottle opener. Well, there's one over here. <laughs> That's what we call a product market fit. You need to understand your customers and their needs. So ethnography, what do people do and why do they do it? That's a very basic uh, way of approaching um, your users, and it's a good way. In, uh, Peter Mobel, in his, uh, I think it's his latest book, uh, Intertwinkled, he says, as information architects, we may ask about the use of systems and services. What tools do you use and why? So if you're into information architecture and you should be, 
That's definitely one of the things you should be able to do. The thing about uh, ethnographic research, and it is very important, I don't want to um, leave no doubt, it can sometimes be a little bit, of, uh, little bit costly. Mm. Because, and I've done this many times, you take your team, you travel to the customer, the user, you have to st stay there, pay for the hotel, the user does all this crazy stuff and you're having a hard time realizing what you have to pay attention to. Then there's the observer effect. Imagine the customer trying to do the stuff he does and you're always like going like this and, and looking across his shoulder. Of course he will change his behavior. So are you re observing the real thing or are you observing what he's sort of playing for you just to, to, to please you. So ethnographic research is very important, but it's sometimes a little bit uh, expensive. That's why in the jobs to be done way of thinking, because we already said to hell with personas, we like to keep it short and doable. We run interviews, but not interviews where you ask people, do you think if we make this button red, you would click it more? Yeah, I think I would probably click it if it would be red. No, we don't ask this, the user this, this is totally wrong. We take something which is called sometimes a job map. It's basically, this is an image from uh, jobstobedone.org and I added a few, uh, few stuff in there. We, we, we take a look at a process, a journey that already happened. So let's say the customer bought a product, or he, let's say he bought a car, or he used this, he used that. And then we try to understand the entire process. So we don't ask the customer like hypothetical questions, if we would offer you this, would you use this? No, he just, we, we ask him to explain to us the journey he already took. And remember, we are talking about the successful completion of a job. The way we do it is more or less uh, we, like, like um, recording a documentary. So, yeah, so uh, the, the, the customer, let's say, he bought a car or he killed your app and, um, and downloaded a new app, for example. And we try to imagine you would try to make a, a documentary about this process. So we talk to the, to the customer and we try to find out what were the steps in his decision-making decision process and what were the forces this, that, that actually drove him towards a new solution or that pushed him away from the solution. There are four forces in the jobs to be done way of thinking. Two positive progress-making forces that promote <coughs> change. One is like the, the push of the situation. You can see, uh, for example, if something is so bad that you simply have to make this progress, or it could be like a pull where, the, where you know that your new solution is so beautiful or so much better, then it pulls the user or the customer towards this uh, new solution. And then you have the, uh, the, the opposite forces, progress hindering forces, which is the habit of the present or the anxiety of the new solution. And you have to understand those, and we, we asked the, 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 the user or the customer in this interview, which is a very loose, and we just, it's a chat basically, we asked him about those forces. And it's super interesting, it's super valuable uh, to hear what those uh, customers come up with. So people don't, write, uh, don't really buy products, they hire them to do the job, and this hiring thing, it's a term we use in the jobs to be done way of talking. I don't know why. We hire products to do a job for us. There's something called a struggling moment. You try to understand this in such an interview. So we, we may ask the, the customer, the user, you know, at one point, you know, describe or tell us about the, the moment you, you, you struggled and what were your thoughts, what have, what have you been afraid about, and what pulled you to the new solution, if at all. 
There's this thing called the switch. Sometimes the entire interview is called the switch interview. As I said, people hire products and they also fire products. So, for example, we at Idealo have a um, price comparison app and it's super valuable to talk to customers or users who fired our app, who said, okay, that's it, I'm fed up with this shitty app, and they, download, they, they kill our app and download the app and, install and, and run the app from our competitors, for example. So it's super interesting to talk to them and say, describe, us, describe to me your process of switching. What did you, what, uh, what, uh, did you, what did push you to this new situation? There's something called the consideration set. Um, sometimes it, it's interesting to understand what other solutions are there you use. So, uh, yeah, There's, uh, you, you get like a broader view of the entire problem space. Those are some questions you might want to ask. What was the problem you were facing? And it's like a really a very open and, 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 and loose uh, dialogue. Where did you struggle? How did you solve the problem? And we really, uh, keep in mind uh, this idea of this documentary. You really try to understand every little step, like making a movie about this hero in this, in this documentary and, and um, understanding this process. And of course you do it like three times, four times, five times, and you start to realize there are patterns. And then you take those patterns and build your solutions for them. <coughs> this is a basic setup how we run it in our team. There's always, so we do these interviews as, as telephone interviews, as I forgot to say this. This makes the thing even more easier because you don't have to travel anywhere. You book your meeting room, you call the user, and you chat. There's one interviewee, but everybody is allowed to, to ask and to chime in and ask questions, but one, at least that's the way I do it, one is the main interviewee. We always ask the, the user if you may record the interview. This makes it easier for us to, to, to document and, other, and analyze and, uh, the, the, the results. We have always one note taker. This, most of the time, it's, it's a student or somebody who is interested in, in, in user experience, so he can take some notes. And then we have, regarding or, or depending on the project, we have different attendees, domain experts, uh, project leads, different people who actually have like a stake in the process. And um, many times, it's, it's really good to have somebody who really, really knows the the topic, you know. I'm there, for example, doing the interview. I'm the UX consultant. I know usability um, laws, whatever. But many times I have no idea about the real topic we are talking about. So sometimes, so and, and the, 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 the interviewees, the, 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 the users we talk to, they really open up after, because we are, we are chatting along and they really open your heart to them, to their heart to you and they begin to tell you all their stories with all their details. And then if you are not somebody who really understands the, the entire problem space, then you can't follow up with the really detailed hard questions. So that's why we always have some domain experts there as well. And after the interview, you run a um, short follow-up session. You just uh, uh, compare your, your, your findings and that's basically it. it and so you can run, an interview takes an hour, roughly, and you can run, let's say, two or three interviews per day, and you have lots of data, lots of finding after three days. A switch interview is something to, uh, to look out for. Always remember this, we fire and hire products. And that's the summary, so jobs to be done is sometimes called a framework, but I don't know. It's definitely what's important to understand is we try to understand the causality. We run interviews to understand the job that's actually trying to be done. Jobs can be functional, emotional, or social. There are different forces that either 
push us towards progress, towards a new solution, or there are forces that hinder us, that keep us where we are, and it's important to understand them. There's a timeline because a job actually is a process, and realizing that this is a process helps us to use all those process tools we already have to, to look at processes. Um, it's important to look for opportunities to, to help customers at every step. It's uh, correct what Alberto says, we have, you might look at a peak at, at the end of something, but if you understand, if you really try to understand with your project team the entire process, and you can, you can write the steps down, let's say, and there could be many steps, mm. and you even can, can, to, can like, publish them somewhere in a, in a, in a, in a how do you say it, in a query, and ask other peers, is this the process you agree to? You can validate the entire process, and once you have validated the process, you can really come up with solutions that try to map the entire, every step, every single like mini job. Um, define your market around jobs to be done. Define your markets around the problem. Don't. Uh, it's true. On one hand, we are the solution experts. Customers or users are problem experts, and we are the solution expert. But it's too easy to. To, to because we are solution expert and perhaps once we came up with a great solution to, to stick with the solutions. We have to remember we have to broaden our view and, and um, define our market around the problem space, not the solution space. And help customers get the entire job done. Brad Will says fall in love with the problem, not the solution. It's what I said already. We have to really begin loving the problem, not the beautiful thing we made. Sometimes we have to kill it and start again. And uh, especially as information architects and people who really love their job and work in user experience and because they, they want to deliver value, it's through understanding the need of our customers how we create value in the world, actually. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> we will take a short Q&A now before Emma starts, but since we're already behind schedule, we will keep it really short, like five minutes. So if anyone has questions to Jan, please feel free. And meanwhile, we switch the OK. Thing. Uh, yeah, let's take care of your uh, uh, the yeah. Yeah. You, you, said, you, you talked about the importance of the environment in the beginning of your talk. I, when, when you do your interviews over the phone, are you not missing the exact perception of the environment? That's a good point. We um, actually try to, we try to, to, to focus on the, the job, the problem people are, are trying to, to get. And we try to understand in this interview, uh, where they were at when they were having the problem. So we try to I'd basically tell them, walk me through your, your, your daily routine. You know, walk me through how you came up with buying this, this product. Or walk me, tell me how, uh, how you came up with the decision of uh, downloading this app. And then we try to understand, and in this discussion they will at some point start talking about the situation they were in, the context, and then we try to, 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 to focus on this, or I try to, to, to zoom in on this and, and, and understand the context, and then perhaps after the third or fourth uh, interview, you sometimes already start to see patterns. But it, it's, a, it's a good, uh, good question, actually, those questions you ask really depend a little bit on the on the product or service you're trying to evaluate or you're trying to understand. Anything else? We can chat afterwards in the coffee thing, coffee break. Okay, one. Well, okay. Uh, your, uh, your business and uh, you work for an e-commerce platform. Yeah. What if for, for things like uh, point of sales? 
What are some of the, 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 the tips and advice that you can give on like helping on creating something like a design that helps really improve that process of point itself, guide the customer to that conversion point? Yeah, it's um, basically what I said. You have to understand what what is it the customer is actually trying to achieve. We in our company, for example, spend lots of time to build features and stuff because our because other e-commerce competitors have them also, but actually nobody really bothered looking at. Um, are those solutions to real problems? Or are those just features everybody has? So I think that's, the, that's in the heart of, of our entire process, to understand the need and build solutions for it. Yeah. 